When you're trying to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for a complicated potential, for instance, a potential v of x that's defined as a function of one region and then another region having a separate function, you may end up with a well-defined solution in region 1 and a well-defined re solution in region 2. For instance, if we had, say, uh, a psi of x that was wave-like, in region 1 and behaved differently in region 2, for instance just smoothly curving down to, uh, to join with the axis, it's useful to be able to combine these two solutions. And the question then is how do they match up at the boundary? This is the question of boundary conditions, which is the subject of this lecture. The boundary conditions that you need to match two solutions of the Schrodinger equation, the time independent Schrodinger equation now, can be determined more or less from consideration of the time-independent Schrodinger equation. What is the allowed behavior of a solution? We've discussed the time-independent Schrodinger equation in detail. You know now that this is the kinetic energy operator, and this is in some sense the potential energy operator. But let's focus on the kinetic energy operator, since it has this second derivative of psi. That's where we're going to get a good notion for what's allowed of psi and what's not allowed of psi. Suppose we had a step discontinuity. Is that allowed? What our psi would look like under those circumstances is something like this. Maybe we have a psi that looks, comes in on one side and goes out on the other. If this happens in an infinitely narrow region, we say psi is step discontinuous here. If we wanted to look at, for instance, the kinetic energy associated with a step discontinuity like this, we're going to need to take a second derivative of psi. So if I take the first derivative of psi, the first derivative of a step function is a delta function. If it's not obvious why that's the case, think about what you would get if you integrated from one side of the delta function to the other side of the delta function. If you integrate from, say, a point here to a point here, you'll get 0. If you integrate from a point here to a point here, you'll get 1. Or you'll get some multiple of 1, depending on if you're, say, multiplying by a delta function, like 3 times a delta function or 5 times a delta function. You'd get 3 or you'd get 5. So as a function of integrating from this point to this point, you would get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, some constant, and then increasing your upper limit on your integration doesn't change your final answer. So integrating a delta function from some point on one side of the delta to some variable point gets you a step. And that's more or less, if you go back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, what you expect if you, say, integrate the derivative as a function of the upper limit of the integral. So the first derivative of our wave function psi here gives us a delta function. If I take then a further derivative, the second derivative with respect to x of my wave function psi, what I'm going to get is going to be the derivative of a delta function. It's going to be 0 away from the step and go both to positive and negative infinity at the location of the step. So the derivative of a delta function is a little bit strange. This is going to, first derivative is going to act like a delta function, second derivative is going to act like a derivative of a delta function. What does that mean? Well, consider calculating the expected value of the kinetic energy. The expected value of the kinetic energy is, can be expressed as an integral of the complex conjugate of the wave function times kinetic energy operator acting on the wave function itself integral dx. Now if we're looking at a discontinuity here, the second derivative of our wave function, which is what we get if we're looking at the kinetic energy operator, is the derivative of a delta function. So we're going to end up with something that's the integral of psi star times the derivative of a delta function. 
I'm leaving off proportionality constants because I'm more or less just trying to argue whether or not this is feasible. So don't quote these as strict mathematical equalities. Looking at this, you know what taking the integral of a function multiplied by the derivative of a delta function is. If not, think about this as integration by parts. You can push the derivative off of the delta on to the psi star, and you just get then an integral of psi star times a delta function. This is discussed in the lecture on the behavior of the delta function. So what this is going to give us is the integral of the derivative of psi with respect to x, psi star, excuse me, times delta of x dx. Now this is an integral we can do. It's just going to pull out the value of the derivative of psi star. But what's the derivative of psi star? Well, the derivative of psi acted like a delta function. So essentially we're going to have delta of x times delta of x integral dx. And this is a problem. You can think about integrating this first delta function as multiplied by some arbitrary function as pulling out the value of the arbitrary function at the location selected by the first delta function. So this is effectively going to give us delta of 0, which you know is infinity. This is a problem. The expected value of the kinetic energy being infinity means that when I ever, whenever I observe this particle, I could get an infinite kinetic energy. That's a problem. So this is essentially not allowed. What that means is that psi is continuous. The other interesting condition that I'd like to discuss is what happens if we have a discontinuity not in psi but in d psi dx. What this means is that my wave function would look like this. Coming in at one angle and then having a kink at the boundary. So instead of having a discontinuity in psi itself, we now have a discontinuity in the first derivative of psi. The slope of psi changes discontinuously. If you look at the Schrodinger equation for this, this is kind of problematic. We're taking the second derivative of psi. The first derivative of psi is now going to have a step discontinuity, so the derivative of the first derivative is going to look like this. It's going to look like a delta function. What that means is, to, uh, to draw that out, d squared psi dx squared plotted as a function of position is going to look like a delta function. The second derivative of psi goes to, zero, or goes to infinity at the discontinuity. But this isn't necessarily a problem because there are other pieces of this equation that we could balance things out with. For instance, if the potential goes to infinity at the dis at this uh, at the boundary, we might have a we might have something that we can work with. So this is a problem. Unless v of x goes to infinity. So this is the sort of allowed behavior that uh, we can have from the wave function. It's always going to be continuous because any discontinuity in the wave function itself gives us effectively infinite kinetic energy. And the first derivative of psi is also going to be continuous unless we have an infinite potential. What this means from the perspective of boundary conditions, what we're talking about now is we have two regions region 1 and region 2, and they're separated by some boundary. Let's say this boundary happens at some position x0. We have solutions on one side of x0, and we have solutions on the other side of x0. And the solutions within region 1 are fine. Psi sub 1 is continuous, and the first derivative of psi sub 1 is also continuous. Same thing holds for region 2. Psi 2 is continuous, and the first derivative of psi 2 is continuous. At our boundary, we have something special happen. 
and we change over from solutions in, bound, in region 1 to solutions in region 2. What that means is that at the boundary, we have to have allowed behavior for psi. And what that means is that psi1 evaluated at x0 must be equal to psi2 evaluated at x0. This says psi is continuous at the boundary. This is necessary in order to prevent our overall wave function from having effectively infinite kinetic energy. That's our first boundary condition when we're matching two solutions together. The second boundary condition, the second consideration we had in terms of allowed behavior of psi concerned the first derivative so unless we have v of x go to infinity at x0, we have d psi 1, and I'll write this slightly differently, d psi 1 dx evaluated at x0 must be equal to d psi 2 dx evaluated at x0. What this says is d psi dx is continuous at our boundary. This is our second major boundary condition, and this holds unless v of x goes to infinity at the boundary. The potential that we're going to consider next is actually a delta function, which means we will have the potential going to infinity at the boundary, and we'll have to consider in more detail what happens when you take the derivative of a wave function or what happens to the first derivative of the wave function at the point where the potential goes to infinity. But overall, these are our boundary conditions for the wave function, solely on the basis of consideration of allowed behavior of psi. As an example, consider a potential step. What this looks like as a function of position is we have a potential on one side that discontinuously changes to the potential to some new value of the potential. Considering what happens, and we will consider this in uh, a lot of detail later on, is suppose we have an energy of our particle here. This would be, say, the energy. On this side, we know we have wave-like solutions. This is sort of our free particle case. So if we're going to have wave-like solutions here, for our wave function psi. On the other side of this boundary, we know we have to have psi curving away from the axis since the potential is higher than the energy. And if we're going to have something normalizable, we have to have the wave function just sort of come in and kiss the axis. So we're going to have solutions in this region, and the solutions in this region are, we'll see, actually end up looking like e to the minus x, and we have solutions in this region that look like sine of x. And if we're going to match solutions that look like sine of x to solutions that look like e to the minus x, we're going to have to carefully tune the constants that multiply each of these, and we're going to have to actually consider also adding a phase to this sine function. So we have two degrees of freedom here, our normalization and uh, the relative position of this function on the axis, and we have our degrees of freedom in this region as well. And in order to come up with something that satisfactorily solves the Schrodinger equation, we'll have to match our constants. We'll have to have the right value of the energy, we'll have to have the right normalization of our sine function, we'll have to have the right relative position of our sine function, and we'll have to have the right relative amplitude of our exponential function. And we'll discuss this in excruciating detail when we get to talking about the finite potential well, where essentially we have two steps, and we're curious what sort of states we can have that are confined to the space. But for now, that sums up our boundary conditions. I'm going to go back a slide just to highlight them again. The wave function itself is continuous, and the first derivative of the wave function is continuous unless the potential goes to infinity.